Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tim Sweeney, and I'm the Manager for Online Learning here at ASAE, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the online conference for small staff associations. I wanted to thank you for joining us for this great learning opportunity. We are delighted to, to have you, and thank you that you are investing in your own learning and that you have selected this program. We know staying abreast of developments affecting small staff associations is very important to you. We have over 90 attendees registered for this first of six education sessions. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted to this conference website within 24 hours of the conference closing on Thursday. Recordings will remain available for 30 days after the conclusion of the conference. We have allotted two hours for this session today, and with roughly an hour and 15 minutes for presentation and 45 minutes for Q&A spread out over the course of that two hours. Please keep in mind that all questions submitted through the general chat box located in the bottom left-hand side of your screen will display for all participants to see. You may also submit an anonymous question to the box at the bottom of your screen. At this point, I would like to tell you a little bit more about our expert this morning, Sherry Jacobs. The session is on the topic of membership, and our presenter is Sherry Jacobs, President and CEO of Avenue M Group. As the founder of Avenue M Group, Sherry is a leader, innovator, and visionary who has helped associations, small and large, tackle their most challenging issues. She is a senior executive, best-selling author, and an association management veteran with more than 17 years of experience. Sherry has applied her experience in research, marketing, strategy, and branding projects to create a unique firm that helps associations meet their goals. Sherry is a top-rated speaker and contributor to various associations and publications, including the ASC publication decision to join. She currently serves as vice chair of the ASC Foundation Development Committee and a member of the Professional Development Council. In January 2014, AC and Josie Bass published Sherry's most recent book, The Art of Membership, How to Attract, Retain, and Cement Member Loyalty. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sherry Jacobs. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be here this morning. I am going to do my best to allow you to ask questions throughout the, uh, the two hours, so you do not have to wait to the end. I do want to let you know that I am, um, I'm not going to be monitoring it. I have Tim to, to I'll pause and ask Tim to, um, to share with me some of those questions. Um, so if you ask a question and there's a little bit of a delay, don't worry, we will get back to you. And we'll also allow for some time at the end so that you can think about some of the topics I'm bringing up and, and ask some questions. Um, so where how I want to start today is to share with you kind of the the challenges that we face in our world today. And there are some, there's some pretty big challenges. Um, and I'm sharing this with you because I, well, I, I am with a, an agency and we work with about 80 associations. I've worked on the staff of a very small association and also a maybe mid-size, kind of depends on how you define mid-size, um, association um, that was regional. So I've worked on the very small five-person staff, and I know they're smaller, but I've worked on the five-person staff, I've worked on the 12-person staff, and I did work at the very, very large association um, before starting my own agency. And today, I work with many associations of all sizes and all budgets. And what's funny is that even the largest associations, which would have a lot of staff, and you would think a lot, a big budget, they're still saying, well, how can we maximize our dollars? How can we reach people in an effective way and get them to respond? And I've even heard many of them say, we don't have money to spend like we used to. We can't spend it on print, and we, we, our budgets have been cut. So how do we do this with no or very little budget? So I'm going to share with you um, some big ideas, some little ideas, and things that I know that work. I always tell people that Every idea has worked, but it doesn't work for every association every time. So um, with that, why don't I get started? So the first thing I want to share with you is about um, how we spend money and what has changed. And it started about 2009 that I started to see a change in how people were willing to spend their money. And I've had so many conversations with people who say, our members are not price sensitive. They can afford this. It, dues are only $200, $45, $50. It, 
it, it's crazy. How come they're not doing it? Or coming to a conference, it's not that expensive to do it. And um, so I hear that over and over again. And I thought about the story about how um, in June, I w drove up to the Botanic Garden, this beautiful place in Chicago near my house that my family has a membership to. And as we drove up, we realized our membership had expired. And the membership's not expensive. And every time I go to this place, my satisfaction is high. I love it. I also believe in their mission, and I know that we enjoy the experience. So when we drove up, and I looked at my husband, and I said, should we renew our membership? Should we just pay for parking? And it struck me. It hit me. I'm like, well, wait a minute. First of all, I'm a membership person, so I can't believe I'm even asking that question. But two, I, I can afford it. Membership dues are very low. And I'm satisfied, and I love the place, and I believe in their mission. So why am I contemplating dropping my membership? And it's because there are other factors that are impacting how we spend money. We think about do we use it that often? And the truth was, in the last year, we just weren't getting there that much. So do we use it? Is it convenient? Are there alternatives? And, the, and again, as I look back at the situation, there were alternatives to how we spend our time. We weren't using it that much. And, and it wasn't as convenient as it used to be. And I thought about this. And I thought, you know what? This is happening in the association world. There are alternatives out there. People are, may not be using the membership. They may be questioning their personal relevant value more than they ever did before, even if they believe in your mission. I even tell people, I say, when I'm in a big audience, and I'll say, raise your hand. Do you support um, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving? Or do you support um, you know, all the different cancer societies that raise money for cancer or children's hospitals? And of course, everyone does. And we believe in their mission, but we don't always give them money because we're thinking about the relevant immediate value. The second idea that I want to share with you is that we now live in what's called the maker economy. And you've heard this before. You've, you've, everybody's heard about the new printers that are coming out where you can take an image and you can actually print it in 3D. And I've thought about this. And as you, people who look at trends and say, well, OK, that's printers and computers, but how does that impact us at associations? What I see that's happening on the horizon is that more and more people are able to make things. They're able to create things on their own. They can bring together a group of people. They can pull together the information they need. Their need for an external source for that association or that organization to provide them with what they need is diminishing. And in part, that's because we also have a sharing economy. It has just changed. We have this. Uh, we have this economy now where people are able to make things, and we have an economy now where there's a growing, growing trend, for, and especially in younger generations, to want to share everything they have and to get this full experience when they're able to share that experience. And so that maker economy and that sharing economy is going to impact every organization's ability to attract and retain and engage members. And it doesn't matter your size. So I'm going to give you an example of one group that knows this and has said, well, what can we do about this? Um, and this group created, um, has webinars. Now, webinars are becoming popular. We're all on one today. And um, I love what they did to really engage and take advantage of this new sharing economy. They created a webinar where they had a speaker. And in this case, they had some panel experts. And they had the 60-minute webinar. Well, for most organizations, that's where it stops. People just stop at that point. And instead, they created an entire discussion in threads. There was somebody monitoring it and said, let's start a number of discussions based on the topics that were shared in the webinar. And so then they invited you know, almost 300 people to join in the discussion. They were all the webinar attendees, but after the webinar was over. And then that created 33 unique authors who were noted and, and, and you know, published, in a sense, in the community, and 86 posts. And if you think about how they were sharing their own experiences, their own questions, their own resources from it, they took something like a webinar and created a much richer experience that when I spoke to the people with this organization, they said this has absolutely not only increased our engagement with our members. So we created a platform that members could have peer-to-peer -peer interaction, 
but they also um, increased that level of engagement and value that the association delivered beyond just the webinar. So those are a few things that I see there impacting associations. The next thing I see, a next trend, and you all know this, is that, that me generation. And um, I've done so many focus groups. I've interviewed people. And I've read a lot of research. And if I pulled it all together, I, I came up with, and, and I've heard other people say this as well, that they care about five things. They say, we want you to listen to me. We want you to teach me, mentor me, reward me, and acknowledge me. And a couple of weeks ago, I was with a, a board of an association, and I shared the slide. And I said, this is really important to this me generation. And um, one of the gentlemen, who was probably about my age, um, and I'm in my mid-40s, he raised his hand, and he said, um, this matters to me too, Sherry. And I said to him, well, it mattered to me, but what's different is when we didn't get it, we, we put up with it. We joined an organization. Maybe we got a little bit of this. Maybe we didn't, but we didn't disengage. We didn't stop joining or, or not renew our membership. And what I'm seeing is that while this has always been important to everyone out there, everyone wants to be listened to and taught and mentored and rewarded and acknowledged, this, this new generation that's entering the workforce, they're going to tell you that if I don't get this, I'm going somewhere else. So that's absolutely going to impact an organization. And as you think about it in your communications and, and, um, and even how you structure everything from volunteer opportunities to speaking to um, contributing to the, to the um, thought leadership or even to the content that you create, at every different level, you have to make sure. This is your checkbox. Are we listening? And it's really to everybody, but if you're struggling with that next generation, are we making sure that they, th do they know we listen to them? Do they know that we're also teaching them, that we're giving them opportunities for them to learn in a mentoring type way? Are we rewarding them? You know, acknowledging is so easy. It's name and print. It is, it's um, sharing the um, information about who has supported or helped the organization and, and letting them know. It doesn't have to come with big budgets in order to acknowledge. The next idea um, that's impacting our ability to, to do our jobs is digital versus print. Um, and there are many things that's been read about, written about this, about that um, movement away from magazines to more digital um, type formats. And I love magazines. I have stacks of them at my house. I also know that as much as I love them, and not everyone does, but as much as I love them, I don't get through them. I don't read them. And if I get a magazine subscription and I don't get through it when it comes up for renewal, I'm very unlikely to renew them, that subscription, even if I like the content, even if it's relevant to me. So some of you may know um, a little bit about me. I'm, a, I'm an avid runner. Um, and I had a subscription to Runner's World, but I just never got through the magazines. I, they would stack up, and eventually I let the subscription drop. But I still am an avid runner. I still want to get that information. So as we think about content delivery and we think about the value of what we have, we have to keep in mind that usage and awareness of those um, products and benefits and things that we offer people, they, they have to be accessible. And I use the word convenient. They have to be convenient for people. Um, the next area that I'm seeing that's impacting your ability to recruit and retain members is um, that we live in a world of customized products. So if you got a smartphone, you would be a little bit upset if somebody said, here's your new iPhone, and these are the apps you get. You'd be like, no, I don't think so. I get to choose the apps. And when I'm tired of playing Angry Birds, I get to delete it and add on a new one. You don't want to have be told what apps that you can add onto your phone. You want to customize experiences, products, what you, what you buy. And it doesn't matter if it's you know, the car you buy or your iPhone or whatever it might be. And if you think about how we develop membership and even education, we tell people this is what you get. You join, and we are going to give you these things. 
This is where you get included, and these are the discounts. And of course, you can pay, you know, you have the privilege of buying more from us, and we'll give you a discount for it. But we're not letting them have any choice. And if somebody said, what is the future? They asked me, Sherry, what is the future of membership? If you were to look and say, you know what, what's going to have the biggest impact? It's going to be the organizations that have found ways to allow their members to pick and choose what they want, how they want that membership. And here is, here is the big thing. Here's the aha. It's not based on demographics. So, and I'm going to go into this in a little bit. But almost every organization I've personally worked for and that I work with will have categories of membership based on if they are board certified, if they are, have a credential, if they are certain years in practice, if they have a certain work setting. Those are all the typical type of demographics that we use to say, oh, you're this type of member. You will pay this amount, and you will get these benefits. And it doesn't take into account the motivations and the interests and reasons that what people want and at different points. Now, a lot of people say, well, what about career stage? You know, you want certain things at career stage. And it's true. But not everybody wants to access those important things for that career stage in the same way. Some people are more social. They want more social interaction. Other people want to access it online. Um, and, and there are different ways that you can get things. So the big takeaway from this slide is you have to think about how you can incorporate more flexibility and customization into the choices that you give to people if you want them to engage. OK, um, the next idea is about the zero moment of truth. And if you've heard me speak, you've heard me touch upon this in the past. And I'm seeing it grow more and more today, every day. Um, it used to be. I, I think back to when I first worked at my first association, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. We had five people on our staff, an ED, a finance guy, the board certification education person, myself, and I think an admin person. And um, I created brochures, flyers, faxes. Um, and then eventually some emails that I sent out to people. And I expected that that was the only way that they would respond and hear about us or become aware of us and respond. And I wasn't alone. This is how marketing has happened forever. It's always happened this way. Consumer companies have done this. We just sent out advertising, direct mail, emails. We put on TV ads. And then it's changed. So. We still do that, and big consumer companies still do their marketing and their advertising, but people don't make their decisions that way anymore. So um, Jim Lipinski, who's with Google, he said the zero moment of truth happens when you hear about something, you learn about it. It could be from a variety of different sources. It could even be from the person selling it, selling membership, selling registration. But you're not making a decision until you ask your peers. And that's the zero moment of truth now. And, and it's funny. I mean, this happens. I think about this when, um, you know, in your own personal life, you want to buy a new product. In my case, I have this big, hairy, yellow lab that sheds so much I could create a new dog every week. And when I needed a new vacuum cleaner and I got tired of them breaking every six months, the first thing I did was go on to Amazon and read the reviews. I didn't go to Consumer Reports. I, I didn't want the expert's opinion. I wanted to know from real people what works so that I can buy that vacuum cleaner that may help keep my house clean. Um, we do this every day. And I have this new book out, The Art of Membership. Um, and I'm going to bring it up because a lot of this is based on it, the, the presentation today. Um, I also want to make a side note that I'm donating all of my profits to the ASAE Foundation. Um, so I don't want this to seem self-serving. Um, but I had a client or an association who said, you know, we're thinking about buying the book for all of our state chapters and our leaders. And she goes, I went to Amazon and I saw you had a great review of it from a membership director at an association. And I thought, you know what, it is happening in a professional world. It's not just consumer products. People want to know what other people think. And if you're not including um, not just testimonials, but real, authentic, ways that people can share what they think about your programs, your products, your volunteer experiences, your leadership, um, <laughs> the different things you offer. If you don't share that, then they are going to, there's a gap. They may not make the decision. 
They may not join. They may be waiting. They may need that information. So you need to think about what you can do. One thing you can do is to create a calendar of every activity for the next six or 12 months. That, and it could be an online event. It could be an in-person event. It could be a chapter event. It could be <coughs> any type of interaction. Create a calendar, list the activities, list the audience, um, identify someone on your staff who can contact them and, and get information from them. <coughs> I apologize. Um, and create a feedback loop where you can contact the people who are participating right now and ask them to give them authentic feedback on what they think. An example of this is I was at a meeting, and the executive director, after the meeting that was held in way up north of Wisconsin, far, far away from where anybody lives, and after the session I gave, a woman came up to me and the executive director and said, this was worth getting up at 5 a.m. and driving halfway across the state to attend. And I turned to the executive director and I said, when you talk about your education, you should say, we put on education or sessions or workshops that are worth getting up at 5 a.m. and driving halfway across the state to attend. Um, that, that's a way you can create <coughs> word of mouth. I'm sorry that I keep coughing. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is find your value. And I have a worksheet for you. And I want to take this moment um, to have, and hopefully everybody has a worksheet in front of them, but if you don't, if you forgot to download it, that's okay. And I want you to think about what is the value? What is it that you offer that is a motivation for people to join? And I want you to write it down, and I actually want you to, to add it into the group chat. If everyone who's on here can just put in there what is something that you value, that you offer your organization, and it's not to everybody, but what is it something that, that your organization offers that is a motivation to join? Now, I do surveys all the time, and when we're doing these surveys, we look at them, and we used to always ask, do you join to, access, to get access to the magazine? <coughs> do you join um, for the discount? Do you join um, you know, for all these tangible things that are the products that people offer? But think about it in a different way. It, think about yourself. Why did you join ASAE? You know, think about what is it that your members join for? Are they joining for a magazine? Or are they joining because they want to get specific tools to help them manage their practice, to help them know very specifically in their area how to do something? Um, are they joining because they work in a very, very small practice and they don't have other colleagues or peers that they can go down the hall to? And that's why they join. What is the value that people join? Um, and um, I'm going I'm to have I'm going to look through some of the answers that people have put on here about why members join. Um, and I'm looking in the chat. I love this. That people join because they want to pick up the phone and, and let's see, our members have stated it's because of the networking opportunities and being able to pick up the phone. I love that. I love that that you wrote that because we often say they join for networking. What does networking mean? I, get rid of the networking. They join so they have the ability to pick up the phone and connect to other people. Um, some other reasons that they join. Um, they join to have influence on government. Yes, but here's what I want you to answer. Why is it important that they have influence on government? Why is that important? You have to keep going because if you just say, oh, we join our organization because we'll be influential, that, that may not tug at, at the people who say, well, yeah, but you have to convince them. Why is it important for them to have that? Um, if they join because you offer them CE, um, why is it important that they get the CE from you? But so keep going with that sentence and answer that. All right, so let me go through some other groups because while we always come up with these big, broad statements, oh, they join for networking or they join for CE, 
I believe that value is in the eye of the beholder and that not all members want the same thing. So let me go through some different groups of types of members and then have you think through from these different groups why some of them, if this relates to your group, why they may join. So we'll do some surveys and we'll ask people about what they value and what are their motivations and their interests. We don't just ask them to rate the programs, products, and services. We ask them about themselves and how they, they, what their attitudes and their motivations are. And what we found is that there are anywhere between five to seven different types of members, not based on demographics, but based on motivation. So here's the first type. You're going to have information seekers. They're going to join just because they want information. That's what they want, uh, on a topic, on a tool, on something to help them do their job. They're not going to join for any other reason. Um, and that's okay, because here's the thing. If they're joining for information and you make them highly satisfied on the information, you make it easy for them to find it, and you give them what they want, they are going to renew. You don't have to engage these people. They, and you don't have to get them to become volunteers. I'm giving you permission to not feel like you have to get 100% volunteer engagement. Understand that you're going to have members that may just join for information. You'll also have members who join and renew because they're lifelong learners. They love to keep learning. And they don't do it just for the CE. In fact, I work with many groups that say, well, they need the CE, but that's not why they take our courses. They, they'll often take a course because they are some kind of um, specialty dentist. And they'll have something come up that they need that information, and they need it now, and they want it convenient, and, and they can get that through our organization. Those are people that are lifelong learners. Um, and so they're going to encourage. Not everyone's going to be a lifelong learner, but some of your members will. You're also going to have people who will join because it's a CE requirement. Just, they, they're doing it because they need it for either maintenance of certification, to maintain a license, because they need a certain number of CLE credits. And they have done the value uh, equation. And they said, you know what, I, if I join and for these dues, I get this amount of um, continuing education credits, or I get this discount. And that is why they join. And they're not joining to participate or to contribute or to advance a mission. They're joining for a very personal, relevant reason of meeting a requirement. You also have people that join that while they get all that stuff, they want to be a thought leader. They're either current or aspiring thought leaders. And they're joining just to be a part of it. And you have to think back and say, well, if I'm telling them that join today because you're going to get discounts and you're going to um, get this information, that might be good. But if you have a competitor and they can get that through others, through other associations, they want to know what are the current, what are opportunities for me to, to be a thought leader, to be a leader within this organization. There are also people that join because they're rising stars and networkers. This is really not altruistic. This is not people who want to be that thought leader, but they are there because they see this as a channel for them to either grow their business or to get a new job or to get a promotion or to move on to somewhere else. That is their, their motivation behind this. And you have members who are mission members. They are, here's the thing, is that I've done so many surveys, and I tend to find that many people, or if you have a trade association, men, there are many people that, that, and organizations that join because they believe in your mission. And they think it's an, either an obligation, or they just personally want to help advance the profession. But I've never found 100% of the members joined for this reason. With very few, I say never, with few exceptions. There are some trade associations. I, I think possibly the National Rifle Association people are joining, possibly because it's not a tangible benefit, but they believe in the mission of it. That's not a, I'm not advocating you know, pro or against them. I'm just saying that there are a few groups. But many, many people who are on this call today, many people who are on this webinar who work for associations, you have some mission members, but not everyone is a mission member. And so if that is a key part of why people should join, you will get some, but it won't resonate with everyone. You have prestige members. 
Um, there are people that join just simply because it looks good on the resume. I've talked to so many young professionals who will say, you know what, they, they, they join because they, they need to get that first job and they want to demonstrate some credibility or some professionalism or that they're a member of association. There are international um, members who will join because it's almost viewed as a credential to belong to an American association. So there are people that are joining for that reason, for the prestige. Um, there are uninvolved members. We call them mailbox members. And here's the interesting thing. You don't have to get them all engaged. I, you know, I remember people always saying, OK, how do I get the uninvolved, the mailbox members engaged? Many of them are OK with it. They join because they want to go online. They read the emails. They read the magazine that comes out. And they're happy with that. And they don't want to become more engaged. It may be because they don't have time. It may be because they belong to another association. And that's OK. If you're focusing on trying to convert them, but they're happy where they're at, then you're, you're putting so many efforts there, and you're not focusing them on the people who do want to get engaged. So I think it's very important to think about that it's OK to have uninvolved members. And then finally, you have transactional members. They are the ones who are simply looking and saying, OK, what is the cost to do? What is this meeting? What's this book? What's this publication? And is it more valuable for me to join because I, there's a savings here? And if you have those transactional members, it's possible that if they don't go to the meeting every year or they don't renew it, they don't need to renew. And that's a reality. And oftentimes people say, well, Sherry, how do we know which ones of our members are falling into these different groups? And there are two ways. The first is you probably have the information in your database. If you looked at your database and you, you looked at people who are coming to networking events and people who are coming to the educational programs year after year and the ones who have never showed up to anything and the people who are volunteering, you may be able to identify them just based on what you have in your database. The second way I tell people, and people always think member surveys, but a census. A census is just simply asking people and saying, listen, I'm at, it's not you know, how are we doing as an organization? Instead, it is, um, tell me about yourself, and I want to put this information into your data file so that I know what you need and what you're interested in. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I want to shift your thinking from how you market, how you sell, how you position your organization, your membership, um, re you know, joining, renewing, um, and even how you bundle things. I want you to think about it less in terms of, OK, they're all joining because we have this mission. We advance this field, um, unless that is 90% of your members. But most organizations have members that fall into these different categories. And now start thinking about, well, what do we offer for all those types of members? What do we offer for the transactional members? I'm going to go backwards really quickly. What do we offer for the uninvolved members? Is there you know, just that digital membership, that resources that we have? Is it easy to find? What do we offer for prestige members? What do we offer for mission members? Um, what's out there for rising stars and networkers? Um, thought leaders, current and inspiring. Um, CE requirement, lifelong learner, and information seekers. So thinking through those different groups and now thinking about all of your offerings, I want you to kind of shift your thinking and say, you know, where do we have the, the greatest number of people in this area? And if you think about your prospects out there, what type of categories are they most likely to fall into? And do you have enough in that area to bring them in there? So um, at this point, before I go into some other ideas in this, I'm going to open it up, Tim, and see if there are any questions based on what I've asked, shared so far. Hi, Sherry. Um, so far, there have not been any questions that, that have come in, but we'll be monitoring that, that question box where you can submit anonymous questions at, at the bottom. Um, it actually looks like there is a question that actually just came in from Kristen. Um, and she's asking, does the cost of membership affect the type of members who are most likely to join? Um, yes. <laughs> and, and you've heard this all before. The people will pay, here's the, the, the big thing, people will pay what you, what you are charging if two things exist, and this is what you need. If one, it's a 
must have. I need to be a part of it. I need to have this information. And two, I can't get it anywhere else. And they, if they feel that the, the price that you're charging for membership or for um, whatever it is, it could be the education, it could be whatever you offer, um, your certification, if people feel that I must have it and there is no alternative to it, then they are willing to spend a high price for it. If they feel that there are other alternatives out there, if they feel that it's not a must-have, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit, then they aren't as likely to join. So there is always that cost value. The second part of it is it's the relevant value. So you, you know, members may believe in the mission, but is it relevant to me, and is that price something that is, makes sense for me to do? Um, Okay, so let's talk about finding your value. Um, asking members, why did you join, why do you renew, and why is that important to you? And we went into that earlier, and I'm going to just kind of glance through and see what people, what people wrote in here. And I, I like some of the things that people are sharing. Chance to present research. Um, people wrote, um, you know, opportunity, how to do their job better. Um, I also saw, um, what else is in here? Um, they perceive that it will help them be more profitable. When you think about why they join, why do they renew, and why is that important, one of the, the steps that some organizations forget to do, and I, I will include myself in this from years back, I, I did this as well, I would throw out all the stuff we have where they can get that education, where they can get that networking, where they can become more profitable. But I didn't connect the dots between what we offer and how they're going to do that. So I do want to walk you through how important that is. The other thing you have to think about is, are your benefits available to everyone, only available to members, free to members, but non-members pay, and discounted to members? Here's what I want you to do. I want you, after this session, to take out a sheet of paper or to go to an Excel you know, file and write down everything you offer. When I say everything, don't write down networking. Look at all the networking events and put them down. You know, write each one down. Write down your magazine. Write down your website if there's things on your website that are valuable. And list everything that you offer. And then next to it, either assign it an A, an O, an F, or a D. You could take this one step further by even doing it by audience segment. Like, do they care even about this? But if you actually do this exercise, if you actually take everything you offer and you look at it and you say, you know what, we've got a lot of A's. It's available to everyone. You have even a greater challenge because you're asking people to contribute money to something that they get anyways. And there will be a percentage of people that will be in favor of that and will do it because they feel that it's their obligation, but not everyone will. You need to find something that is an O something that's only available to members. Even if advocacy is a cornerstone of what you offer, if there is a community of peers that you can bring together to discuss it, to be a part of that voice, and it's only available to those members, and that matters, you need to identify ways that you can bring peers together and offer that O, offer that only available to members. Um, the D is good, too, and the F, free to members, non-members must pay and discounted members because there are those transactional people. But take this exercise and, and just do that where you can think through what you offer. And find out why. Here's one of the things. People say, well, what's the value? What are you interested in? Why do you join? But you forget to ask, out, ask why. And so we're now doing surveys where we say, is it because it's required or because you enjoy it? I know it's hard to believe that some people find things fun and enjoyable. And I used to do surveys where we didn't have that as one of the options, and people would write it in. You know, why do you attend the meeting? And we didn't have because it was fun and enjoyable. And I started hearing that over and over again, that there's an audience segment that really know they can get education elsewhere, but they want to come to the in-person meeting because it's fun and enjoyable. If you hear that and you know that's why they join, you've got to incorporate that into your messages, into your marketing. Um, find out why. Is it to increase my marketability? Is it because I wish to be recognized? I want to give back. 
you notice that my list here is different than probably the list that you usually see. I join for the magazine. I join for the website. I join for, think about the why behind it and write down your list of why, why people join. Now, now that we've kind of talked about your organization and you know, why people might join, we can't do this in a vacuum because there's something that exists out there called the next best alternative. And I have a picture of wine bottles because um, my example is I love a great glass of wine. And as much as I love a really good glass of wine, um, more often than not, I get the $10 bottle of Kendall Jackson or Jaylor. I don't buy the $100 bottle. As much as I love it and the quality and, and I know how much I'll enjoy that glass, the next best alternative is less money. It's not good. It's not as good. But here's the thing. It's good enough. So if you think about why people join and what are their motivations, write down a list of the next best alternatives that are out there. And I have a worksheet with this where you can write down um, the company or organization. It could be a, any, any type of company or organization. It could be a publisher. It could be, um, um, it could be another association. It could be Amazon. It could be anything at all. Write down what they have, the products and services. Think about what is positive and negative differences between the two. Think about the value and the price. And if you complete this worksheet, if you write down what are all the alternatives to what you have, it will make you, again, understand that whole value and cost and how they, that play into it. I don't know if anybody um, has one that they can do as an example. But as I'm talking, if, if you guys want to just take like, two minutes and take out that sheet and write down an organization or a company or something that is an alternative to who you are, to what you offer. Write down something that they offer. Write down something either positive or negative that's different between your organization and what they offer. Think about the value and think about the price. And then write that into the group chat um, and send that in um, so that, that people could um, see, uh, or so that I can see um, an example of, if you understand that. And if you have questions, if you don't understand, please type in your question. Tim, did any questions come in about Next Best Alternative? Yeah, um, we actually had a few jump in on the on the last on the last section, um, and I, I can go ahead and uh, jump into those. Um, one one came in is um, that um, Barbara was asking, what is the best method for tracking your marketing promotions? I'm sorry, could you say that again? What is the what? What is the best method for tracking your marketing promotions? I don't think there's one best method. I think that um, if you are segmented in your marketing and you identify this is what we're selling, this is the specific audience, um, and are we attracting people, you know, are people responding to this based on um, not just one effort, but multiple efforts and looking at a total campaign and not just those one-time emails. Um, to me, that is the best way. I think that one of the, that when you start tracking marketing efforts and you start thinking about, well, we sent out this email, we got a low response rate. Or we have it on email, we have it in a magazine, we sent out a mailer, um, we have it on the website, and one of those is low. Um, I think you're doing yourself a disservice in thinking, well, that's ineffective. Because um, what I found to be most effective in tracking your, your efforts and the results of them is, is usually that the cumulative, the integrated effort to get the word out there and to keep it top of mind. And if you overall are successful in moving that needle and getting people to join, register, attend, renew, whatever it might be, you have to think about the cumulative effect, the, the, all the efforts together in there. Unless you have a very sophisticated system for tracking every single response rate to everything. And most associations, small and large, don't have that. All right. Um, so I'm trying to see if there are other questions that are related to next best alternative or if anybody has, oh, two alternatives. Okay. 
So somebody said there are two alternatives um, to his organization, the Academy of Management and SHRM. And one is primarily academic, and the other isn't scientifically grounded. And that's, that's true. Those are, so if you look at those two organizations, and you look at what they offer, and you look at the different audience segments, your primary members that you are trying to attract, and you think about, well, they can go there, and some will go there for some things. Um, and you think, well, we have higher quality, or what we offer is, is based in science. Um, you have to think about, that might be important to you, but in those audience segments, what's most important to them? What is most important for them to join? What is most important for them to have access to? Um, you know, why would they join? And that, and again, going back to that idea that not everybody joins for the same reasons, you have to keep that in mind. So here's an example of SHRM that I think is a good example. Um, I, I work in the association world, and all my clients are associations, and I work in marketing, but I'm also a small business owner. And I join SHRM, and I don't know, if, I don't think anyone from SHRM should be on here because they're not a small association, but um, I'm pretty public with this story. I, I joined SHRM because I wanted access to some of their small business owner tools. I have no interest in volunteering. I don't want to get any kind of certification, and I don't want to come to their annual meeting. None of that holds value to me. The only thing that holds value as a small business owner is access to the tools. And if I get that, I'm highly satisfied. But one problem is that I spent a year getting emails and promotions and direct mails on things that weren't relevant to me. And it was almost like they kept saying over and over again that we have all this stuff and why aren't you getting involved and you must get involved because that's where the value is, when that's not what I wanted. And if they had looked at, if they had asked me a couple questions when I first joined, they would have realized this is what I wanted. Now, I have many other places where I can get those, those resources and tools. And if that's the case, maybe I'm not the target person that should be, they should be going after. So my point here is, is if you look at your prospect audience and you think about all the different people that maybe find value in what you have, there's probably a core membership and even other members who find value in what you have, and then there are people on the outside. And they may come in for transactional reasons and they may get what you need, and if you're the only one that offers that and you offer it for a good price, there's enough value for them to join. But if there are alternatives out there, that's not where you should be spending a lot of your time focusing on. Okay, I want to share another concept with you, which is ability to pay versus willingness to pay. So, um, and this again is important. Now, um, willingness to pay. There are probably people who are on this call here today who have many um, songs that they've downloaded from iTunes. And there are others that have just a few, less than 100. There are people that have over 1,000 and less than 100. And I find this with every audience. The price to download a song is $1.29. It's not expensive. But your willingness to pay, some people have a greater willingness to do it versus others. Everybody can afford the $1.29, and it does cumulatively add up. But still, they're not that expensive. But some people are more willing to invest more than others. That's willingness to pay. You also have ability to pay. Um, now, this picture of this artwork. And I went, walked into an art fair one day and with, this, with this empty spot above our mantle in our living room. And I really, we've been looking for years to, to find just the right painting up there. And I was willing. I, I wanted to. I mean, I really wanted to get this art work. But it was so expensive. It was way outside of my range. I didn't have the ability to pay for that. So as you think about your members, there is a willingness of some people to spend their own money outside of what their employer will reimburse to go to education to join extra memberships, and there are others that won't. And then there's the ability. And some people, some things may just be out of their ability to pay. That also impacts their decision to join or to register for a meeting. Another thing that's going to impact it is the competition. So think about your association and what is it that you're in the business of doing. The, the big story about Kodak going into bankruptcy was that they forgot what they were in the business of doing. They were in the business of storytelling, of helping people tell stories. They got so focused on the cameras and the film that they forgot they were in the storytelling business. 
So they didn't think about the competition as anybody else that could help people tell stories. If you think about your organization and what you're in the business of doing, you know, and you think about who the competition is, it is anyone else that can help your members um, become more profitable, grow their business, connect with peers. And as you think about that and you think going back to, well, what marketing tactics should I do? How do I get people to join? What messages should I say? You want to reemphasize that what you're doing is helping them solve those problems. And so this is the next thing that we're going to get into, and I want everybody to, to do this next exercise and, and do it. And it's called, you need to be a problem solver. You, you sh when you go back and you look at your recruitment materials and your membership materials and even your meeting event information, it's not selling membership or networking. You have to be a problem solver. So um, when I um, was training for the Boston Marathon, I was so excited that I finally qualified and got in. It's a really hard race to, to qualify and even to get into. And about four weeks before the race, I got an injury. And I went to a physical therapist, and instead of selling me products or giving me a program, here are some stretches, and here's a little band for your knee, she solved my problem. She said, Sherry, what is it that we need to accomplish? And I said, I must run Boston. <laughs> I, I need to get there. What are we going to do to solve my problem? And so we went through a schedule. How many days would I work out? And what kind of stretches could they do? And what was the specific problem? And I was able to run Boston. And as I think about that, I think associations need to think through what problems they're solving. You know, if you think about it, people don't buy gym membership. They buy a way to look better, get fit, and lose weight. They don't buy shampoo. They buy beautiful, clean hair. So you have to think about, at your organization, what problems people have and how you can solve them. So an example is, um, uh, is from um, an organization called Bixie. And my friend Greg Fine used to work there. And he would tell me that every quarter, um, he would walk into the office, and he knew the results had come in from a certification exam, because so many people failed it. And he would walk in, and he could look around, and, and just everyone in the room, all the staff, their shoulders were slumped over. They felt it was just such a hard couple of days, because they spent every day saying, no, no, you didn't pass. I'm sorry. No, you, you failed the exam. And after hearing this and seeing this, he decided to outlaw the word no. And everyone on his staff said, you're crazy, Greg. And he said, no, I, I, you, can't, you cannot say the word no. When in, they said, well, how are we going to tell people that they failed, that they didn't pass when they call? And he said, you are going to offer them ways so that they can pass. You are going to offer them solutions instead of just saying to them no. And so they, they came up with, as each person called, they would come up with, these are the areas that you didn't pass, and these are the programs and the products and the ways that you can pass it the next time. And so they stopped they stopped saying no. They also stopped selling membership or certification or education. And they started selling solutions, honestly, to what their members and their non-members, their prospects wanted. So if you if you have a lot of members who are starting out in their career, you know, thinking about um, are you just starting out? Are you well established? Now what? Do you know it so well you can teach it? Are you ready for your second act? And then you go back and you connect the different benefits you have to these different issues or problems that people are facing at their different point in their career. So what I want everyone to do here is to write down what problems do your members have, what programs, products, even membership do you offer, and then write down an outcome of that. So, and, and then type it in here. If you can write in what problems do members have, just come up with one. What, what do you offer that is a solution to that, and what is an outcome? Because that statement, if you're able to do it and start not with the offering, don't start with networking, don't start with membership or benefits. If you start with the problem, then connect it to what you have, and then connect it to an outcome, people are going to connect with that, and they're going to read that, and they're going to respond to your recruitment and retention efforts. So if you can just, um, if people can type that in, 
Um, and I will look through some of the group chat questions that might be here. Um, so if anybody can, can add in here um, a problem that they have. And, and again, if you go back to my um, kind of um, real world area, I, you know, the problem is you know, why you join a gym membership. You join because you either want to get fit, you want to get healthy, you want to look better, you want to lose weight. Those are the problems. That's where you start. And then you connect to what they have. So um, I see people are talking. Members have difficulty um, following the rules and regulations that come with managing a practice and remaining licensed. OK, good. That's a problem. That's where you start. You, know, you start thinking about, we have problems with um, managing all those regulations. You don't start with the solution that you offer for it. You start with that question. That question could be in your subject line over your email. That question could be on your website. That question could be on, on a um, brochure. Start off with the question of, are you struggling to, to manage all the rules and regulations? Are you, start off with that question. And then connect them down to what you offer that you have, and then share with them the solutions of people who have accessed it. So I apologize because it's not as easy as a presenter to then read through feedback here, but I'm going to try it. So there's going to be just a pause while I read through and see what other people say. So somebody Carrie, talked about, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Carrie, there, there was a question that came in um, asking, how do you solve a problem that is member initiated? Yeah, I, I saw that question, but I'm not sure. Maybe the person can write back in an example of what is a a little more information, because um, I'm not sure what's this. It's hard to answer that question. <laughs> so if they can get just a little more detail, then I could probably help with that one. Um, OK, so we have people say, members feel underappreciated or not respected by their supervisors. Um, that's great. So you know, and that could be young professionals, or that could be mid-careerists, or it could even be any point in your career, really. But you can feel underappreciated, not valued for what you have. I was working with a healthcare IT group, and there was a group in there where everybody else in healthcare has different certifications that are recognized, and and this one segment they didn't have it. And so when the association created this new certification it still wasn't recognized within their community. And the association realized that we need to bring some prestige and some recognition and work with not just the members who are going after it, but the employers about why that matters. Um, OK, another problem that members have is mistakenly thinking that sustainable meetings are too expensive and complicated. And so if you think about that, thinking back to the details of it, even the sustainable meetings, like, and I don't know enough about sustainable meetings, but it could be that um, the different elements of what creates a sustainable meeting. Sometimes when you use very big, broad terms like sustainable meetings, people gloss over them. They ignore it. So if you actually give an example, they think that eliminating water bottles, and that may not be it, but <laughs> eliminating water bottles is too expensive for them to do. Give a very, very tangible, specific thing about they can't do this. They're afraid to do this. And that, and then if you can then connect it to, did you know that we actually teach you how you can make it so that you know, um, eliminating water bottles is a sustainable way and it cannot be expensive, and here's an outcome that you will have. Um, be very, connect, start with that problem that members have, connect it to what a program, a product, you know, I know ASAE has a sustainable meeting program with their annual meeting, connect it to it. And then talk to the people that have been to that program in the past and talk about some of the outcomes where they've gone and they've gone back to, them, to their association and what changes they've made and what have been the outcomes of that. Um, and what I'll do, because it's kind of hard to think these through just as people are putting them in, but I really value that you've added your input, is I will look through this after today's session is over, and I will help you. I will, for everyone that submits it in, I'm just going to write down and, and help you with the, the, the problem, potential offerings, and then just kind of help you think through the, the benefits and outcomes. So um, keep adding yours in. Um, go back, think about it. We have the worksheet in, in the handouts. And if you didn't get the handouts, which I've seen some comments, 
don't worry, we'll get them to you afterwards. Um, they pretty much are the same as the slides on here. Not the slides, but this question. But think through the problem, your offerings, and your benefit. And go back to all of your marketing materials, your emails, your website, and start off with the problems that your members have. OK, I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, don't sell everything, sell what matters. I have seen over and over again organizations try to have this huge long list, 75 reasons to join, and they'll put in uh, all the different you know, affinity programs and benefits, and they'll throw everything at you. And I've been in the same boat. I mean, I've done it because I've said, um, well, I don't know what they want, and so I'll just throw everything. When you join, you get everything, and let them pick and choose. But you're actually making your membership seem less valuable. People look at that long list of 65 things, and you're forcing them to go find something that matters to them. And just simply pulling together, whether it's in a brochure, on the website, in an email, um, categorizing things by things that matter. I want to get ahead. I want to be more profitable. I want to um, connect with peers. I want to learn how to deal with the regulations that are you know, bringing down my business. I want to make a more efficient business. Start off with the things, the topics of why they come to it, and then group your benefits underneath it and sell what matters. Is this why you want to come in here? This is what we offer. Don't make them go through a really long list based on publications, education, and networking. Instead, um, recategorize what you offer and connect it for them. You may also want to take a few things off. I've talked to a few very successful small association people who have said, you know what, we had too big of a portfolio and we weren't doing things well. So we said, you know, let's do a few things really well. We're going to only offer what's unique and needed. And if you are not the CEO and you can't take away a few things, then promote what's unique and needed. Don't promote everything that you have that they can get in a lot of different places. If you want someone to look at your organization and respond to your recruitment request or respond to something you have, Make one point in it, make sure it's unique and that people need it. Look for areas where you excel. This is an interesting idea. Look for product extensions. So let's say you, your association offers something that's amazing in this one area. It could be a topic. It could be a certain networking opportunities. It could be um, the resources people need to handle regulations. Whatever it might be, think about what you're offering and how you can create more products under that same topic. Think, connect with your members. Ask them to help build more things around it, to share resources around it. Take your webinars or events that you may have and think about how you can expand that experience with people. Um, all right, so I'm going to, before I go into how to measure member engagement, um, data strategy and storage, um, I thought I would go back to them and see if there are any other questions that have come up. Yes, yeah, so there, there was a question that came in the group chat, and um, the question was, how does don't sell everything relate to your point that everybody wants different things? Oh, okay, that's a great point. <laughs> so um, when I say don't sell everything, I'm saying don't mix everything up under our typical traditional categories of um, that we that we often do. We do it by publication. We do it by education. Those are ways that that traditionally many associations have tried to group their benefits. They do it internally by what makes sense rather than externally. So in the thinking that you have maybe six different or seven different audience segments, um, if, you, if you find out, if you go into your database and you say, you know what, these types of members come to every meeting that we have. Um, they are lifelong learners. You know, this is what's important to them. You know, taking a little bit of time and using the data in your database and trying to send out messages to people that have come to your meeting every time, they don't need to have the same messages to people that have never come to a meeting. It's about market segmentation. It's about learning a little bit more about the different types of members and grouping the benefits in ways. Are you an information seeker? Are you seeking out the tools and resources? This is what we have for you. And trying to use the data that you have and 
and incorporate that into your market segmentation. It's not easy. I mean, there, people want a surefire way to recruit members. If I create this one campaign and send it out to everybody on my prospect list, they're all going to respond, or they're not going to respond, but maybe I'll get a 1% response rate. But if instead you created smaller lists, if you looked at different audience segments of different kinds of um, prospects and segmented it, much smaller lists, and tried to share one idea with them, come in from this, and test out different ideas that, doesn't, that don't sell everything, but just sell different um, reasons why people may join, um, what I have found is that it's much more effective to bring people in. OK, behavior and preference. They're two very different things. You probably know this. You probably know that um, people may say, you ask them, well, how do you want to network? How do you want to um, get education? And on a survey, they'll say, in person. I want to come to in-person events, and I want to network in person. But then if you look at your attendance, what they're actually doing is different. All the, you, know, you may have had, if you've done a survey, you may have had 50% say, I prefer in-person learning, or 80%. But you don't have 50 or 80% of your members coming to an in-person conference. So if you rely upon what people say, just their preferences, and not on their behavior, then you, it's, very, it's very hard to connect with them. You'll lose them as members. It's more important to look at their behaviors and Think of all the benefits that you can offer on, based on behavior rather than on express preferences. A great example from the consumer world is something that came out years ago. And it was, um, it was actually, if you look up um, epic failure, epic consumer failure, it's like the number one thing. And it's the Arch Deluxe. And with the Arch Deluxe, McDonald's came out with this burger, and they asked all these people. They had focus groups, and they had people taste it. And they said, do you like the burger? Yes. Would you buy this burger that you like? And everyone said, yes, I love it. It tastes great. But they didn't connect that they liked them to the fact that the behavior of most people who go to McDonald's want something that's budget-friendly, family-friendly. They weren't going there to buy a gourmet burger, and they wouldn't spend the money no matter how good it tastes, on a gourmet burger at McDonald's. And even though they had $200 million to spend on this campaign, it's considered one of the biggest epic failures in, in consumer goods and consumer history. I think about that in the association world, that we, we, we so often ask, how do, you, you know, how do you want this? How do you want this information? And how do you want to interact? And we don't pay enough attention to what people have done in the past. And if you go back and you look at well, are people more interacting online? Are there more people that are attending webinars than actually say they want webinars? Are we offering enough benefits to meet their needs? Because the reality is their, prefer their preference is m more important than their behavior. So think about your membership. And, and think about that member that's in the middle of that bullseye. And that member, um, and again, you have different types of members there. but there's certain traits of that member. And each ring around it is somebody that has less in common with that core member. And the outer ring are individuals who have very few things in common with your core member. And you either have to change what you're offering, or you have to price it differently for them to join. So if you go back to those different audience segments, those um, individuals who may be transactional only, you may see, if you have a lot of them, you may see them join and then drop out. And then they come back in, and then they drop back out. And if you had a category for membership that allowed them to be that transactional, to take advantage of that one benefit when they want to at a different price, then you, have, you may have a greater chance of keeping them. Um, that may not be your goal. You may want to have people that are highly engaged. But again, not everyone's going to want to engage at that level. So what I recommend you do around data and trying to understand your membership is to look at past activities. Look at the frequency of what people are doing. Look at your demographics, but look at the motivations. And then look at the convenience sector. Are things convenient for them? Or are there alternatives out there? And ask your members. Not just how interested and satisfied they are, but what motivates them? 
What have they done in the last 12 months? Not, you know, ask them what they prefer, but then ask them, but what have you done in the last 12 months? What learning style works best for you? And what's stopping you from doing the things you want to do? This is all this stuff. I'm about to go into some really great fun tactics and new ideas about how to recruit members. The stuff that I've been sharing with you is laying the groundwork so that you can now, when you are coming up with the tactics, the types of campaigns, the messaging, the different vehicles to get people to join, you now know a little bit about the different types of members that you have and the motivations that not everyone joins for the same reason. And so if you create messages that focus on this is a primary reason to join and they, that doesn't resonate with them, they won't join. So I'm going to move into now some ideas and tactics. But um, as I move into this, um, and these are this is the fun stuff. This is the stuff you can take away and you can implement immediately. But before I do that, Tim, are there one or two questions that came up? Um, not at this time that are that are particularly related related to this section. Um, there are some ones that came in towards the towards the, the very beginning of the session, and if we want, we can loop towards those towards the end. Okay. Great. Okay, so um, giving them the tools is one of the most important things. Um, I, I'm going to share a variety of different ideas about um, spreading the word. Remember at the beginning I talked about that zero moment of truth and how important it is that members can um, have that peer-to-peer, -peer, what do you think of this, should I join, what is it that you get out of it. Um, if I speak to many, when I speak to many association execs, um, they'll say, you know, people learn about our organization from their friends and peers. It gets recommended by a colleague, it's through a program in school, um, it's through a coworker, or somebody recommends they join. We know that, but we struggle to have a peer-to-peer -peer recruitment program that's effective. I'm going to share a couple examples. One is the American Bar Association um, knew this. They knew that lawyers were more likely to join the ABA if they heard from another lawyer this is, that you, you know, John, you got to join. This is what you're going to get out of it. So they created this program, and even though they are a very, very, very large association, they had zero money in the budget for this program when it started. And so they started with their leadership, and it was just a, a simple program where they asked every single person on the committees and, you know, within their leadership to say, um, just ask one. Just ask one person to join. Um, we're not going to do the rewards at first around getting whoever gets the most people to join. We want to see if we can get everybody to ask at least one person to join. And they created some online tools. They created digital um, gift passes that they, that they gave to their leaders that their leaders could then give to a colleague or friend and say, here's a gift membership to them. And that helped. And then once that was successful, they expanded it to the entire organization and to staff. Um, most of it, and I'd have to go back and look, but I think the majority of this Member Get a Member program was digital. They used Facebook, they used email, um, but they really asked um, their members to share with other members what is the value, and then they gave them the tools. They gave them this free membership, a gift of membership that members could give on to somebody else. So, and it wasn't a, here's a, a membership application, it was actually a free gift of membership. And that helped increase membership. Also, the Just Ask One program was very effective in helping members um, recruit other members. Um, I did a program years ago, which was called the Buzz Ambassador Program. And I created a bobblehead, and I put in a bunch of fun things into a kit. And I asked people, who wants to participate in this new kind of program? There's no requirement. You don't have to. There's no requirement to recruit people. It's just you're willing to take the kit, and if the opportunity arises where you can share information about our association, you would share it with them. And it was very visual, and it was fun. Um, and the bobbleheads cost $7 a piece, I think. And we created this bobblehead campaign. And when people saw them, they started telling other people about the bobblehead and then about the membership and about the association and have you ever attended a program that was worthwhile and they started just talking and I didn't give them talking points. I, I, I encouraged them to just share their own experiences. I created postcards where they could send us back notes 
about it. But I also created something visual that they could show and be reminded of the program. I gave them the tools. And our organization's membership grew by more than 30% that year because just mostly from this campaign. Because once somebody joined through it, then they got a bobblehead kit. And they were doing it. So one of the keys to creating that effective member get a member program is actually just giving them the tools, that free gift of membership, that the ways that people can visually and see it and encourage other people to tell people. Um, another idea that I've done to get people to join and become engaged is you have to create a sense of urgency. So frequently I get early bird registration or join by this certain date, you know, and it may be three or four weeks out, and I'll get a discount. And so with the American Academy of Pediatrics, we wanted, we had no money to spend on a brochure or on mailings, and so we created something called Thrifty Thursdays. And every Thursday, we send out a notice. It's on the website, and it'll go out in an email, but that's about it. And we put it on, on Facebook and social media, and we tell them, use this discount code, and we send it out Thursday morning, and the offer expires 11.59 that night. It's a 24-hour, that's it. That's all you can do to take advantage of this. And that urgency created such momentum for people to register for programs. We had one webinar where we increased attendance by 1,700%. And I get final questions. People will say, well, have you trained people to just respond to this Thrifty Thursdays? And the answer is yes, but the numbers were large enough, and the discounts were small enough, and the incremental cost to add somebody was negligible so that it's okay that we train people because our goal when we started this was to increase attendance, and we achieved that, and to get more people, more butts and seats. So we wanted to create an urgency. I've thought about this. If you, if you do a direct mail campaign, if you do an email, if you do a recruitment program, it's not just about making the ask and asking people, this is why you should join, and here are the benefits, and connecting the problems to your solutions to the outcomes. But the second part of that is to create some kind of urgency that they have to act today, right now, if they want to get certain things. They want to get that special offer. Otherwise, it's very easy to, to put it aside. The next idea is um, to, to do the VIP or the sure thing. Um, so every organization has members that should be members but aren't. Now, this isn't you know, the huge prospect list of 1,000, 5,000, whatever it might be. This could be 100 people. It could be 50 people. But every organization, if you sat down, and they could be heads of industry, they could be member, you know, members of a trade, they could be individuals, um, it could be young people who've just graduated from a program you know, and, and are new to the profession. But everybody has that list of people that absolutely should be a member because they are similar to your current members, and you know that they, where they are, they would value what you have. Here's what's different about the VIP sure thing. You don't ask them to join. You enroll them. You automatically enroll them in membership, or it could be even in a program that you have. Um, so if your membership comes up for renewal every year, April 30th, you might enroll them January 1st and just say, you have been enrolled in membership. You now have this membership, and your membership will come up for renewal April 30th, and you don't have to do anything. They are just, they have become a member. And when their membership comes up for renewal, they can decide if they want to join, you know, renew their membership, or let it lapse. And you're just very clear about this. This is, you, you are now part of this membership. Now, I've done this, and I've had a friend of mine who's also done this with a couple of organizations. And we both found that if you have a highly targeted list, and this isn't to everybody, but this is to that small group, if you have a highly targeted list um, that you do this with and you send it out, um, I've had a retention rate, a renewal rate of up to 80%. Now, again, this isn't because I've sent it out to thousands, but it's just sent out to a small group of people that are in there. Um, Again, it, it, is, it can't be for every organization because you may have other qualifications to get them in, but think about how you can tweak this for your organization. Um, 
So I'm trying to see if a question came up around there. Um, if, if they are automatically renewed, couldn't that turn off members who would prefer to have the option of renewing themselves? And let me explain. It's, they don't automatically renew it. What happens is if, if you have a once a year where membership comes up for renewal for everybody, or you can just put them in and just have, just have it a short-term membership, and you've targeted them, and their membership now comes up for renewal, and you ask them to now pay the renewal fee, to join. Some of them won't, and if they don't pay the renewal fee, then they're out. It's not like you have a member, you have a credit card where you're automatically renewing them. You're just putting them into the renewal cycle where you've asked them to now rejoin the membership, just like any other member is doing. Um, this can backfire, though, if you don't target the right audience. So I know of a group that tried this. But they tried this with an audience they said is very hard to get. They're like, we really want to get in this one audience segment. And they're so hard to get into their membership. So they said, we're going to give them all a free membership. And it failed. They had almost no one reading. And it cost them money. And the reason it failed is because they didn't have the benefits that those people would want. So even when they came in to the membership, all they felt like they were getting was now mailing saying, hey, buy more from us, Take, you know, come to our meeting, buy our books, and they were frustrated with that. Um, and, they, and all the things that the organization was trying to sell wasn't relevant to this group. So this could fail. This program could absolutely fail if it's, one, not highly targeted to people who should be a member, and two, you don't have things that they want when they become a member. Um, I noticed on here that somebody added, we give non-member speakers full membership. Not sure of the retention rate, um, but I know I've kept some people. And again, if your speakers are people that are within the industry and should be a member, it, that's a great way to get them involved, especially that first year when they first join for that. Does anybody else have questions about the VIP sure thing? I'll let them. If you do have a question, feel free to add it to the group chat or to the anonymous questions. OK. The next thing is so important. You're writing copy for your membership um, appeals. And it could be, again, it could be an email or a brochure, whatever it is. Are you the star, or is your member the star of your message? Do, you, do all of your marketing messages, your email campaigns, your um, brochures, your website, do they all start with ABC Association does this. We, ABC Association provides you with networking. ABC Association provides you with education. Or do all of your messages say, you will get networking. You will receive this. You will advance in your career. I know that sounds so small, but if you actually go back and you look at every single communication piece that comes out from your organization, shift the focus from your organization to the member, to the prospect. Every word that it may say is shift that focus in there. Um, you know, I, I kind of pick on um, ASAE in this area because I know that they have a mission that says ASAE will connect great ideas and great people. And, and I don't remember the exact statement. But I think if they instead said, you will be connected to great ideas, great people, you will be inspired. It's just so much more impactful than hearing about the organization that does so many of these things. You also need to leverage content. Because it, for people who are non-members who want to become part of your organization, they may not know that the value you have in your organization. They may not believe your big statement. We provide networking. We provide education. We provide the tools you need. Instead, start with the content. Do you have an article? Do you have a story to tell? Look for content that you can create. One way you can do this is by doing a best of the best. Um, that's what Harvard Business Review does. That's what um, a lot of different organizations that have some great content, instead of trying to write a recruitment brochure that they'll send out, they will actually pull together a paragraph, a headline, you know, three or four paragraphs, whatever it might be, the best of the best from the previous year, from all their, from their magazines, from their content, from an education session. And they'll put this together. And they'll, they'll send that out, the best of the best. And if people 
if it's content that people value and they want and they need, then they respond to it. I've done a number of campaigns, recruitment campaigns, where we started with the content. Um, or you can do a news jacking, which is taking a topic that's very big and in the news right now and connecting it to a webinar or a session that's for members only or that members get a discount to. Um, Harvard Business Review, again, they, they have a lot of content on their website and, and sessions and education they offer, um, but they always put that little key on there that you can get a preview of it, but you have to subscribe or be a member to get access to it. So think about leading your marketing, um, your recruitment materials with content rather than just saying that we offer the tools, we offer the education, or we offer the networking. Um, I have a um, the book that I just wrote that came out, and instead of trying to promote the book with just little promotions about it, I've been doing a blog post every week where I take a topic in there that I think that people will be interested in that topic and connect it back to the book rather than just doing tons of promotions about the book. Um, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because just like you have a small association, um, I have a small agency and I don't have a huge resources and a huge website. It's very easy to create microsites, to create a blog where you can take all the content from everything that you have and post it on that blog with a simple link to your education, to your membership, um, to a program that you have coming up. But that content is what people will share. You know, people, if they download that white paper, it gives you the names of people who are interested in that content and want more on that topic. So thinking about that content and what you have, thinking about does it solve a problem? Does it leverage your strengths? And here is the most important question you need to ask, answer. Does what you offer offer something that members cannot do on their own? Use those words. You know, put that into an email. You know, remember there was a commercial that came out years ago, and I think it was from AARP. And it was just the idea that if we could do this on our own, we wouldn't need our association. I, it was brilliant. I loved it. Um, but thinking about the specific things that you guys offer of what is it, like if you could answer all these questions, you wouldn't need us, but you can't. Our members can't. And because you can't do it on your own, we are here to help you. We have all this that is going to help you achieve what you need to do and to solve those problems. All right, my last shift and topic is thinking about the future. Um, and I think about, um, there's a uh, famous hockey player named Wayne Gretzky. And he is, um, he's famous. Even if you don't like hockey, you've heard of Wayne Gretzky. What most people don't know is that when he entered the NHL, he, most, most critics and professionals, did not think he would succeed. Even though he was successful in the juniors, they didn't see, think he would succeed in the NHL. And part of it was because he was um, not as strong as others. He was not as fast as others. And in fact, year after year while he was on his team, they would have these, um, they would have the players do different tests. And he would come in last year after year on all the other players on his team in terms of strength and agility and um, flexibility and speed and all these other areas. So why is it that this person that people didn't think would succeed end up becoming the, the best hockey player of all time? And people said it's because he didn't play to where the puck was. He played to where they, it was going to be. And part of that idea is you, you can't just be where your members are today. You have to think about where they're going to be in the future. And I love this idea that in sports, Success on the field isn't the result of just talent and strength alone, rather that it comes from being able to pick up on visual cues and anticipate what will happen next. And if you think about what's going on in your industry, whether it's healthcare or manufacturing or um, the legal profession or education or whatever it might be, what's happening next? And if you want to write an email, a direct mail, marketing copy, if you want to capture the mind of the people who are not currently members and get them to want to be a part of your organization, you have to show that you are thinking about what's happening next and you're incorporating that and that you're an organization that reflects that. 
I tell the story of um, a company that I helped start about 14 years ago, 15 years ago, called Show Payroll. And um, it, we started this company at a time when nobody was online doing any financial transactions. The, the iPhone came out in 2007. The only thing people were doing online in 2000 was um, looking up sports scores or doing things that I can't say online in a webinar, you know, or doing email. So um, they weren't banking. They weren't doing any financial transactions. People didn't trust it. So why can a company that has huge competitors out there that are alternatives, ADP, Paycheck, these other companies, well, how could we come out there and compete with the big dogs out there and doing something where people aren't even there yet? And it was because we knew there was a problem that wasn't being solved. People still need something that was affordable and convenient and reliable. And so we created this company that provided that solution. But as the company grew and it became the largest online payroll company in the world, which happened way after I left it, and so I you know, didn't profit from that at all. <laughs> didn't make any money. I got out too soon. But they, they were so successful. And I talked to the president of the company, and I said, you know, how have you been able to sustain this success? And he said, we, we have a contest here every year called the best new mistake. And he said, if you think about the world's like, top baseball players, um, they go to bat 10 times and 7 times they fail. They're only batting 300, but they, they're allowed to do that. Why aren't we allowed to do that in the workplace? And she goes, so I give out an award that you have to self-nominate for the best new mistake in thinking I'm building a culture where people will take chances. And I share this story with you. Because I want you to take some chances in the headlines, in the copy, in the way, in the things that you do, so that you're trying something a little bit different. Um, you know, Michael, who was that president, he said, "Go to the world is going, not to where it is today." So the last idea, um, oh, I've got two more, is um, prove it. And I shared this with you earlier, but if you're going to say you have the best networking, if you're going to say we have CE, if you're going to say we offer um, a community of the peers, all that stuff, it's like blah, blah, blah. Like people don't read it. It's invisible. You have to prove it. So going back to that story where I spoke at that conference, and it took hours for everybody to drive up there, and it was at 9 a.m., and, and after it was over, somebody said that was worth getting up at 5 a.m. and driving halfway across the state to attend. You know, listen to those comments and prove it. Don't say you put on eight half-day education sessions with top-notch speakers. Say you put on education that's worth getting up at 5 a.m. and driving halfway across the state to attend. You know, don't say we put on networking that where you'll meet top professionals. List the names of the people who were at the last session. You know, make people feel that this is what the last, you know, the people that came to our last networking event made five new contacts that night. How many did you make last month? You know, do things that you can prove it, where you can incorporate those real stories into those headlines, into those appeals. You know, a great way to do it is to write down these four questions and ask people, in your own words, how would you describe this? Um, how specifically did XXX, how did that help you? What did you find remarkable about whatever program it is? And what specifically makes you want to renew? You know, those, those types of questions go a little bit deeper, and then when you get those words, then you incorporate it into it, and that's how you can make the member is the star of the marketing. That's how you, you, know, you start off with, OK, I want to make the member, the prospect, the star. Well, how do I get those words that they're saying? These four questions are a great way to do it. Another way to prove it, I love this, um, socialmedia.org, they don't just say we're a community of um, the social leaders of the world's greatest brands. They say, were people like you? They took a photo from an education session and actually put in names of people from General Motors, from H&R Block, from AT&T. And they, they, they drew in a little like line and drew to the, where that person was in that session. This is brilliant. This is on their website. Um, they, it's such a simple way to proving who you are you know, and, and that, that you're people like you. And don't forget to overcome objections. So write down a list of why everyone's going to say no. They're going to say, no, I can't join. I, 
I belong to another association with overlap value. I don't have time. It's too expensive. Write down all the reasons why people will say no and come up with your answers. Because if you don't come up with it and then put it in your marketing materials, they're going to answer it for you. I one time did a campaign where we put out, um, it was, um, it's too expensive. And then we went into a whole thing about, how, did you know that this is what is included, that you get these things? And it was a focus on, on um, education, and we, we, we addressed right in the headline the objection that people would have, and then we overcame it. Um, a great way that you can gather this is to create case studies from videos or online reviews um, and then connect those case studies to membership information and connecting perspectives to current members, connecting those people together. So the last area I want to talk about is the first 90 days. Um, and I'm curious here if anybody, and if you do, I'd like to hear it in the group chat, do you, when somebody joins your organization, do they just come into and become a member and get the member stream? Like they get the member welcome packet probably or an email, and then after that, after that first interaction, thank you for joining, here's your welcome packet. Or you know, it could be an email, it could be a mailing. Do you have anything else to onboard people? And if you do, please add it to the group chat so you could share it with others. Most people I talk to just have a process where somebody joins and then they get the welcome packet, and now they get into the regular communication stream. So going back to when you think about the different why, reasons why people join, if you want to know why people join and then make it more segmented in your messaging, you need to have a 90-day onboarding program. What are you going to do during those first 90 days? And here's why it's so important. If you do not create a, a meaningful one, at least one meaningful interaction with new members during the first 90 days, the, the, the likelihood of them renewing drops dramatically. So for, during your first 90 days, what are all the ways that you can have a, have a, have a meaningful conversation and interaction with them? Um, some suggestions that I offer for you is, um, oops, that's about the creating meaningful interaction, is to create a new member landing page. This is different than your why join page, and this is different than your now that I'm a member. Create one page that is the new member landing page that you have a link to. It could be on your website, or you can create it on a blog, separate, a microsite, whatever you want to do. But when they join, give them a link to it mail it to them, email, make sure they go to it. And you can make it interactive. You can ask them questions what, you know, about why they join. What is it the one thing they want to get? If, they, if you have a great list of things, I joined because I wanted access to discounted education. I joined because I wanted to download this white paper report and you had to be a member to get it. I joined because I needed uh, to grow my business. You're going to hear all these different answers. You know, but then you can respond to that. You can put that into their data file. You can point them to resources. Or if you're a little more sophisticated, you, when, when they respond to a certain selection of, of options, as soon as they click on it, then maybe you can, you can um, redirect them to a page with those resources. Um, but create ways that you can interact with people during those first 90 days. Create video vignettes. Let them pick and choose what they matter, and make sure you call, email, and ma or mail. But create one big interaction with them. Um, I see somebody said, we have a committee that sends a welcome email, um, but colleague to colleague, um, and then they reconnect in six months. Um, we've had some people reconnect in person. So um, I think those are, those are great ideas. But, um, and other people say, we announce new members in our newsletter. That's great, but that's actually not, and it's good. You want to keep doing that, but that's not interacting with them. And that's acknowledging them, so that, that checks off that box. But you want to create something that allows them to find out what are the things that you offer that's going to provide most value for why they joined at that moment. So somebody asked, what's an example of a new member landing page? And I see that. Um, Kristen added that AAUW local chapter made a big impression on her when the chapter president called her after she attended her first meeting. 
but missed her second one and, find, and wanted to find out why she joined. So the first thing, I think it's great to have phone calls. I think that's so important. Um, other things you can put on that new member landing page are, um, uh, first of all, a question. Why is it that you wanted to join? What is it that you need specifically? <laughs> and introduce them to different things. Do you want to meet people within the field? Here's how the opportunities that we have for you to meet people in the field. Do you want resources? Here are the link to the resources. Do you have a question for the staff? Here are the list of the different staff that you can call on these different topics. But make them feel special, both in phone calls, like Kristen said, um, acknowledging them in a newsletter so other people know that they joined, and having staff and volunteers connect with them and call them so that they can find out more about what it is why you joined and point them to the resources that they need. Because again, back to everyone's not joining for the same reason. Finally, be flexible. Because you just got to remember that not all members want the same thing. And to make it personal to them is going to not only um, increase the likelihood that they'll renew, but it's also going to make it increase the likelihood that they're going to share it with others. So um, I know I've given you a lot of different ideas here. Um, I, I gave you some tactics um, that, that I've used, whether it is a um, uh, the, the VIP sure thing, um, whether it is member get a member, but just ask one campaign, make the member the center, the prospect the center of all of your communication, um, create much more segmented marketing, start off all of your emails and your communications with, if, if you want to make them the center, it's not just using the word you, but it's starting with the problems that they have that's how you make them the center of it. And then you connect them to what you offer. Just remember that the association second, the member first. So with that, I'll see if there are any other questions. I know it's, sometimes when I speak, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. So I have a lot of information here. Um, but um, hopefully I've given you some good things for you to think about that you can um, make some changes. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions offline afterwards as well. So Tim? Yes, um, we we definitely had a few questions come in, and they're kind of from all over the the, uh, the presentation. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of start with the ones that most recently came in and start kind of working towards the, the back. Um, there's a there's a question um, regarding re renewals. Um, um, the participant asked, "I think auto renewals are best with with a professional organization that already has a high renewal rate." Do you think that trade or professional groups are more likely to find positive feedback on this? You know, I'd love to hear from other people as well, but um, I, I think that the more flexibility that you give people for renewals is great. So not just auto renewals, which I, I, I've heard very positive things about. I wouldn't be surprised if a few people have had a, neg a few negative reactions, um, but I've had very positive. Let me expand on that. I have found that organizations that allow more flexibility in the payment process um, can get people to join. And here's a perf perfect example. For years and years, my alumni association said, join as a life member at $750. And year after year, even, if I, even if, as I've um, gained more experience and you know, my income has gone up over the years, I've never wanted to spend that $750. For the first time, they said, we can split it out over 12 months. We can split it out over tw 24 months. And all of a sudden, or 10 months, $75 a month for 10 months, and then I'm done for the whole rest of my life? I can do that. And I'm a pricing person. I know what they're doing. <laughs> but I can do it. It's more flexible. So whether it's auto renewal, or it's monthly payments, or it's quarterly payments, all of those things, that type of flexibility, People will join. They will respond. They will renew. You're giving them more flexibility in that. Great. Other, um, another question? Yes. Um, there, um, there was a question regarding, uh, this was kind of in the middle of your, of your presentation, um, kind of regards into surveys, questions, and polls. Um, and the question is, do you have any suggestions on how we can get members to participate in these kinds of surveys, questions, and polls? I'm sure you were giving some specific example, but it wasn't specified in the question. Sure. Um, so w I do a lot of different things to get um, people to participate in polls and surveys. 
Um, the first thing I have found, and I've tested every single offer, every single incentive. Um, in fact, one time I sent out a survey and I had six different types of gift cards to see because I was curious to see what are people responding to the most. And four to one, everybody picked, nearly everyone picked um, the Amazon gift card. Then I also have tested out um, dollar amounts. And I have found that, surprisingly enough, for $5, even with physicians, a $5 Amazon gift card to 20 people, you, you know, and, and your odds of winning one out of 20 is a great incentive. I've done it for the first 200 people who've responded. Um, it all depends on your budget. But um, years ago, I used to say, well, it has to be like $50, and you'll get more response. We need a higher number. What I've found now is if you give people a greater odds of being selected in the random drawing, and even if it's a small amount, people will participate. And even small dollar amounts, people are very responsive to. Now that's members. Non-members have no skin in the game. It's very hard to get them to respond. So with a lot of non-member surveys I've done, um, I will just simply say, you know, I'll be thrilled if I get, you know, 200 non-members, even if it's qualitative, even if it's not a huge number, but if I've heard from 200 non-members, that's some good data there. So even if I give them each $5 Amazon gift card, I will get the response there. So um, Amazon really works, a small amount works, and even a larger quantity, a random drawing for one of three, one of 10, one of 20, rather than just one grand prize, because nobody feels like they're going to get, they're going to be selected for that. Great. Other questions? Uh, yes. Um, there was a question of, of the seven types of memberships you identify, are you seeing in your research and clientele that one or two of these types seem most common? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Sure. Of the seven types of members you identify, are you seeing in your research and clientele that one or two of these types seem most common? Yes. So um, the most common that we see, and this won't surprise anyone, is um, the whether it is a networker or the aspiring leader or that, that highly social want to get involved. And, I, I, and again, when I say most common, most common means anywhere between 23 and 28 percent. So even though that's most common, that's not a majority by any means. Um, the second group that often I see tied with that is a lifelong learner. Again, not surprising because people who want to join associations tend to join for many different reasons, and they will stay with it because of that that membership. Um, I also wouldn't. I would also say there's a the potential for some survey bias where you could see that people who are likely to respond to a survey are potentially maybe likely to be people who care much a lot about the association and are lifelong learners and are um, aspiring leaders. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there, that it's not perfect, that no data is perfect. There's always some survey bias, but those two groups tend to be the strongest. Um, I also find that most groups have between eight and 10% that are uninvolved, disconnected, don't really care. And if that number is higher than 10 or 12%, you should be very concerned. If it is about 8 to 10%, you're pretty much on par with what we've seen. And again, it, it could be slightly higher because it, those people may not have responded to the survey, so that, that's a part of it. Um, but I tend to find the uninvolved members are around that. Um, you have people that are in their minds highly involved, but they don't come to your meetings. They feel highly involved because they read the magazine cover to cover, they go to the website, they attend a webinar, and they have friends that they have made, but they've never volunteered for anything. And they don't really want to. And that's OK. And you'll see a good percentage of those. Years ago, I used to say, our goal is to move people up the engagement ladder. I don't say that anymore. I say our goal is to deliver satisfying what people need based on what their needs are. So if they need tools and resources, make it, you know, make them highly satisfied and easy to find and make sure they're they're available. If they want networking and business development, make sure those opportunities are available. So it isn't all about how do I get more people to volunteer and engage. If a lot of people that do want to volunteer and that happens to be your group, then you should focus on how can I create more micro volunteer opportunities. So it's not a one-size-fits-all answer either. So I also saw in there that, that people say that they work at academic institutions where you can't offer 
um, multiple year memberships. And I've worked with a lot of organizations that have a lot of academics as part of their members. And um, in the, this is the case for, for many of them. Um, we, we break it into two areas. First, a lot of academics, they used to have their institution pay for one, two, or three memberships, and that's dropping. Now they'll pay for just two or just one um, membership. So what's happening is that some people are going to have to choose between paying for it out of their own pocket or not belonging anymore because memberships aren't being reimbursed at the way they used to be. So when you offer um, either multiple payments or a multi-year membership with a, a good discount, like an, a really good discount for doing the multiple-year commitment, then you will find that people will um, pay for it out of their own pocket. You're giving them an incentive. Um, with others where you have the institution that's just not going to pay for it out of multiple years, what, we have ch what we've shifted to is rather than the auto-renew or the multi-year membership is creating a good, better, best membership model where we offer um, three different levels of membership. And it's not based on demographics. It's just based on the benefits you get. So like a light or a digital membership, a full membership, and then a premium premier membership where the benefits we're offering in that premier are somewhat intangible, but they're prestige and they're excitement. And again, I'm giving you these ideas. We do a lot of data before we build this up, before we figure out what's going to be in each category. But there are a lot of different solutions, and a lot of that's in the book as well. Great. Any last uh, questions? Yes, there, there are, there are two more that that I had to come in. Um, this was kind of, this was relating to the topic of uh, membership kinds and types. Um, and the question is, while we can examine our database to help us decide which kind of members we have. Is it unseemingly simple just to ask? I love that question. Yes, 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 please ask. <laughs> so I mentioned this at the beginning, but I might have said it too quickly. Don't just survey your members in an anonymous survey and ask them what they think and want and need and are interested in. Do a separate, completely separate census. And I say it's separate because you want them to be candid in your surveys about what their needs and interests and satisfaction are. And separately, ask them personally and say, this is so that we know more about you. Ask them about what they want and you know, the information that you can put into your database. It's not a how are we doing survey, it's, but it's, a, it's just simply a way to get a little bit more data points that you can put in your database and tell them it's a census and we are connecting this to your data file. So you always want to be candid about what you're doing and how you're using the data, but absolutely ask your members. <laughs> I'm glad they brought that up. Great. And the final question that I, that I have is, a number of associations in our industry have begun to move to free or $0 memberships instead of increasing costs elsewhere, for example, an annual conference. And they are now shifting to an all digital communication and journal distribution. What are your thoughts on this? I think that you have to do the financial modeling. I think you have to know, is the audience large enough, and what are, where, will, where will you make your revenue streams if you're going to do this? You also have to start off with, really, really simply, what is your mission? Is, is, if, if a certain thing is your mission, and your mission is to achieve something within your industry, and you think that the best way to achieve this is by making sure that you have everyone within that, that industry as part of the organization. And you have the numbers. You've actually done the financial modeling where you can say, we estimate that these amount of people will come in free, and this will come in at this, you know, at this price point. You can, you can offer those type of memberships. It's not that I'm in favor or not in favor of them. What I'm in favor of is making sure you've done all of your due diligence around what are the financial implications and what will be the impact on the organization, rather than just simply saying, Free membership is a, the solution that we should offer. I, I never go down that path without thinking through all the financial implications and the revenue streams and what you're trying to achieve, and let's start with the goal. So that's not an easy answer, but it's really the best answer. Great. Um, and there was one last question that came in the group chat, um, and it's, should this consensus be part of the new member communications that may have been related to a previous question? 
You know, I think it's great to make it part of the new members. I think that as soon as you have that onboarding program, as soon as someone joins, get to know them and get to know them through a phone call, get to know them through um, that unique member landing page where you can ask them two or three questions about them that you can do it. But you also have an entire membership where you need to collect that information as well. And I also know that things change. People change in their career. They change in their interests and their needs. There are times when they have no time to volunteer, and they have times when they have a lot of time to volunteer. There are times when they are just they are just the peg in the you know they are just there to get the work done. And then there are times when they shift to a new position and they're expected to bring in the business. And because there are so many shifts in our lives, that that census that you need to do. I mean, if that's your top priority, and it should be, you should know your members better, then I recommend doing this census at the minimum every two years of all the members, of trying to collect as much information as you can that you can use. Don't collect information you won't use, but collect as much information that you can use um, and do it frequently. Um, and don't just rely on it as a one-time thing just when they join. So do it when they join, but do it frequently for everybody. Well, great. Um, that um, that was all the questions that that had come in, um, and I think with that, unless Sherry, do you, have, do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share? I am putting up my email um, in the group chat, and um, I don't know if I'm going to get a few questions or a lot of questions. Um, but I will do my best to answer any question at least this week. Um, if there's a few, I'll answer it quicker. Um, but if you have any follow-up, feel free to send me an email, and I'm happy to answer. Great. Um, and thank you very much. And with that, that is going to bring um, this morning's session to a close. I wanted to thank everyone for participating in this informative session. and really extend a special thank you to you, Sherry, for sharing your time w with us today. I think everybody got a lot of value out of it. Our next session um, is on meeting management and is scheduled to begin at 3 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon. So thank you all for joining this morning and look forward to having everyone on this afternoon.